I trained yeah. for two and a half years. Boxing, everything, right? I turned my body into a weapon. Like, that was my goal. My goal was to do three things every day. Train spiritually, physically, and mentally. So I would get right with God. I was reading the Bible. I was going to church. I had my little Bible study. I was reading books for my mind. And then physically, every day, just training, training, training. Emilio, the honey Urutia! Yo, 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 ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Honey Badger Hour. This episode of the Honey Badger Hour podcast is brought to you by the original Clippers Barbershop. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Honey Badger Hour, episode 95. It's your boy, the Badger, and we are back with another special episode. Thank you all so much for tuning in. Shout out to all the subscribers. Make sure to like and subscribe on the button below right here. All right, guys, we got fresh merch out, so make sure to check out HoneyBadgerLifestyle.com for all merchandise. Check us out on Patreon and members only. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this week on the Honey Badger Hour, we got a very special guest Introducing UFC fighter, man of God. How do we say? Uh, uh, how do we say? Like a born again Christian? No. Uh, how do you say? Uh, yeah, 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 man of that. God. Okay. Recovering addict. Yeah. All around badass. Now, a new crypto. My man in the crypto game. My man in Heine. What's up, my man? I appreciate the intro. Yeah. Good to see you, man. We were. Way on the other side of the world in Thailand, some crazy stuff went down. I know you remember, of course, and uh, yeah, it was right before COVID. That's how we met. Um, you know, I had some kind of career changes as far as like the gym that I was in. I left my old coach and, um, you know, I was like, man, I need to refocus. I had two losses, my first two losses. Um, you know, I was, I was number nine in the world in the UFC and um, I just needed a reset, man, and I knew... It's just that warrior spirit of traveling the world and, and training with different people. And I just fought the Russian and I lost to the Russian. So when I went to Thailand, there was all these Russians. And I was just like, yes, this is where I need to be. So it's, it's good to see you again, man. Beautiful place you have in Miami. It's cool we linked back up in Florida. And um, yeah, I appreciate you bringing me on the show today. No, my brother, I know you have a great story and I'm excited for the fans to hear it, you know. I'm pretty sure we would t we even talked about you doing the pod when you were in Thailand. I'm pretty yeah. we had it going on even back then, you know. Yeah. So I've been wanting you to share your story with the fans, but honestly, it's way better now because now we got the proper production, you know. Yeah. If we would have done it in Thailand, it just would have been on the iPhone. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, man, it's cool to see your podcast grow. And guys, this is the guy you should be subscribing to. Like, no offense, to MME Media, but this is it's different when a real fighter. A guy who's been through it interviews someone, it's just, you're going to get real questions. You're going to get a lot deeper, a lot further than that surface level questions to someone who's never competed. And no offense to the guys, you know, the MMA media, you guys are doing good, but you guys just aren't one of us. And um, so I'm going to share a lot more and uh, subscribe to my guy's channel right here. My man, the takeover begins now, dog. <laughs> we out the fighting game. We might be out the fighting game temporarily, but that just means the fighting game, I feel like prepared prepared us to take over the real world now you know like yeah. all the things you learn from there man you know yeah you're actually the first interview that i've done um since my announcement you know i've kind of had that video kind of booked away for a while wow. i was trying to do it like three months ago and i've been fighting these injuries um you know for about a year and a half now even more coming on two years you know i fought i'm a you know i took a good knee in that fight cut me open kind of threw an overhand he switched knee it caught me it caught me clean it was like one of the cleanest shots i've eaten in the cage and in the octagon but um you know it was uh i was fine after that and you know the crazy thing about fighting is when you're in that cage when you're in the octagon and you're fighting that adrenaline is so high i think it protects the brain but i took about a month off i did a little bit of training came back in the gym and just got caught with a clean head kick and sparring should have been sparring that many rounds being that out of shape that long in between training and after a fight should have took it a little easier but you know kind of jumped in and and got dropped man and and it was like crazy symptoms mood swings slight sensitivity irritability um it's hard man concussions are bad bro you got to just lay there and you have the crazy your anxiety spikes through the roof and 
you know, after about a month, it started to go away, it tried to go back in the gym, and it was just this cycle of making it worse, trying to go back, you have this voice in your head, like, bro, you need to be training, why are you not training, you're good, and then you go in there, and you train, you're like, I hate this, I want to quit, what's wrong with me, I just want to feel normal, and so it's been a lot of back and forth for me, and I had to pull out of the fight with Sam Alvey last um, January, and, you know, that was a good fight for me, so that, that was a tough pill to swallow, and, you know, I've been to Mexico twice for stem cells, two uh, injections in my brain stem intrathecally, which is crazy, but it made me feel better. And then I went back, I think, too early again. So it was that fight of, you know, trying to push through a head injury, which is the dumbest thing you can do. Yeah, and the one with the head injuries, you know, and it's so new that we don't really know what's going on, you know? Like, we don't really know. It's so hard in the brain, right? Like, it's a, it's one of the things we haven't really figured out yet with all the knowledge we have and uh now, with all the things that we know, it's it kind of makes you, like, it's hard to deny, you know? Because right now, for, fighting is good for now, but, and it's, like, what, what makes us kind of, like, for me, I know for sure, like, kind of, like, completes me, you know, when I'm training and feeling good, but, yeah. man, like, um, it's the long-term effects. I, I don't know if the juice is worth the squeeze anymore, huh? Yeah, I mean, it, it just, I just want to feel normal, man. I don't, I don't want to be stuttering. I don't want to have, like, loss of direction and balance and have this vertigo and stuff like that, so... It was, I mean, it was a no-brainer, and I'm blessed that, you know, I found cryptocurrency, and I've been going hard in it, and started a YouTube channel. Um, shout out, subscribe to my channel as well, Crypto Kings. Um, yeah, it's popping off right now. Yeah, yeah. That's my awesome, my, bro. my new My new nickname has kind of become the UFC Crypto King, and I'm blessed that I found it, and really how I found crypto was um, when I was injured, I heard all these guys are going to this bio accelerator down in Colombia and doing these stem cells, and I was like, man... I was like, I need to do that. Then my buddy Eric Anders went to this place in Mexico called Cellular Performance Institute. And I reached out to the guys because I was seeing if, if Bile Accelerator gave me a sponsor. And they're like, nah, we're, we're done doing sponsors. I was like, okay. Yeah. I reached out to the guys in, um, in Mexico and they were like, hey, this is the quote. And, it, you know, it was around like 30 grand. Like, and I was like, bro, that's, you know, it was tens of thousands of dollars and there's no guarantee. And I hadn't fought in so long. And you know how it is as a fighter. Like, you can't be dropping that kind of, that bread and, and just be like strapped like that. So, um, you know, I was like, man, maybe this is it. I don't know. And I was just kind of praying on it. And, um, I jumped on this Twitter space and all these fighters are getting paid by this cryptocurrency called Marshallino. And I jumped on. I seen that. Yeah. Yeah. So I jumped on a Twitter space and I just poured my heart. I was like, bro, I only get paid when I fight. Um, I probably spent 10 grand on this fight camp. Wasn't able to compete. I don't have health insurance. I don't have, you know, any kind of pay that I'm going to get. And I was like, and I can't afford this. And I told them about the stem cells. They called me up back to that Twitter space and they're like, bro, we want to pay for this. And I was like, wow. I was like, really? I, I didn't believe them. And they sent that 10 Ethereum. And at the time it was worth, you know, three grand a pop. And I, would, and I just sent, and I hit up the cellular performance too. They're like, yeah, we take crypto as payment. Boom, boom. And I was like, bro, the power of crypto is insane. They just sent it to you like, yo, ten crypto. That's you can't just send that in USD like real easy, you know, right? Like no. you can you can't give that to somebody like it's got. I reckon it's gonna be hard, but with crypto, it's just like on the on just the phone, boom, boom, click boom, boom. a button. And a lot of places are taking. So if people pay you with crypto, you can use it. So that's what you use to get your your. The, yeah. Oh wow! And they took care of it for you. Yeah. And is that, is that kind of like what opened the door for crypto for you? Like, well, oh. I just saw the power of it. It's peer to peer transaction. The whole point of crypto is taking the money of the centralized organizations, the banks, the Federal Reserve, you know, having that third party that gets to control it, monitor it, take fees along the way. You have a, you have a, a de decentralized wallet. I could send you crypto. I could send you 10 million like this with a, within minutes, you would have $10 million. Boom. Like that Sunday, Saturday, 1 a.m., 2 a.m., doesn't matter the time. And I was like, wow, man, the power of crypto is crazy. And I think it's really giving the power back in the hands of the people and taking it away from centralized. That's why the government hates it. That's why they're attacking it. Yeah. And uh, that's why Bitcoin's so crazy because, you know, Bitcoin is this machine that is decentralized. Nobody controls it. It is a machine. All these computers that mine it, they push the power to the cloud, which holds a set amount of Bitcoin, and every 10 minutes, one Bitcoin gets minted. And if they mint too fast, the code gets harder for them to mint. If they mint too slow, the code makes it easier. And it's just constantly minting until there's 22 million Bitcoin. Um, there's a cap, right? Yeah, and then once it's all minted out, that's it. That's the entire circulation. There'll never be more. And um, that's how it goes, man. No one controls it. What's the name of the guy that uh, 
What's the name of the guy Satoshi. that they say? Satoshi. Yeah. Nobody knows who he is, though. That's what I'm worried about, man. Who the hell is this Satoshi guy, bro? I mean, it really doesn't matter, and it could be a group of people. Yeah. Because right now, there's no admin keys. I mean, it, there's nothing. It's a machine that just goes by itself. If they, if there's internet, there is Bitcoin. That's proper AI, huh? Like, for real, for real. It's like... And but when the blockchain, yeah, you can't. There's no like accounting. There's no niching the. There's no like greasing the stats and stuff like this, right? Nothing. You can see everything all yeah, the time. Yeah, on EtherScan. Yep. And on, on the blockchain. And on scale, like you can just pull it up and get it when you need it, like the ledgers and stuff, right? Like you can. Yeah, you can store it on a cold wallet. You can store it in a hard drive. You know. All right. So when you buy crypto on an exchange, though, it's not your crypto, right? So like, no. if I get crypto on crypto because I have a bunch of crypto, but it's well, me and my dad have some crypto and it's on a crypto exchange. Yeah, that's But dangerous. I need to, you need to learn how to take that out. Put it on decentralized and, exchange. And you got to put it like on... Um, Ledger. And you can put it like an USB or SD card and just hold it on and that's your money, right? Yeah. Well, basically what the Ledger is, um, it's an extra layer of protection. You have your seed phrase for your MetaMask. So that's 24 words that you have to know. That's your password. If you can memorize them, you can walk around anywhere, log in, MetaMask, type your words in, boom, your crypto's there. You can do whatever you want with it. Wait, now, MetaMask is a... Sorry. It's a is decentralized a... wallet. Okay, okay. It's like, um, I, had a, I had another one. I forgot the name it's of it. It's basically, the way you can say it is, if you hold crypto on a centralized exchange, it's like holding it at a bank. It's like and what so happened with SBC, right? FTX. FTX, yeah. yeah. So if, that, if, if the bank closes down, like the Great Depression, and they shut the doors, there's nothing you can do. But if you hold crypto on, a, on your own decentralized wallet, on a ledger, it's like you have a safe at your house. And then what's good is the safe that you can just put in your pocket. Yeah. And it's easy to hide, you know? Yep. Oh, man. So, and the thing about, all right, so now with the banks, right, with the Federal Reserve, I, they say that's like what all the things that happened in America, like all the problems that we're having is like kind of from them, bro. Like the Federal Reserve, like that's when we got we got off the gold standard, right? Yep. And they've just been loaning out money for years and years and years. And eventually that ticket's going to, I mean, that, that they got to pay that piper eventually, right? Because yeah. like right now they just keep on pushing it aside, pushing it aside and printing more money. Yeah. Now, the digital currency that the government is trying to do, is that different from Bitcoin or is oh, that yeah. similar? Oh, yeah. No, that's... Because uh, they're saying the that's going to be... Centralized yeah. Bank. Uh, I forget exactly what it stands for, but it's basically a stable coin. You have USDC, you have USDT. It, it's pegged to the dollar, so it's $1. So you're, it's still in crypto, but it's always going to be $1. It's not going to go up or down. And they want to use that um, as... So, like, for example, people will use it... Say Bitcoin hits 100,000 100, and you want to cash out, but you don't want to put it in USD. So you would just cash it out into USDC, which is a stable coin. Is that the Tether one? Uh, USDC different? is the Coinbase one. USDT is the, is the Tether. Okay. Um, so the government wants to come out with C CBDC, which means they're going to you're going to, everything's going to be digital, but the problem is they can control it. They can monitor it and they can shut you off if they want. And Florida has banned it. And that means it's basically a centralized cryptocurrency. They control it. Bitcoin, they don't control. Ethereum, I mean, it's, it's a little bit different than that, but Bitcoin is fully decentralized. Ethereum now is more centralized, um, the way they've turned to proof of stake, to proof of work. So, um, or sorry, proof of work, to proof of stake. We could go very deep in that, but uh, the government's trying to push that on. It's, it's even biblical. There's gonna be I was going to say the mark of the beast, dog. Currency. The mark of the beast, bro. That's the mark of the beast, right? That's what uh, they're saying. No, Have you heard just, about this one? It just says that crypto will, or I mean, it says the world will have one world currency. And that's what they're pushing for, to have like a currency that's digital and a currency that they control. And then you have no control. That That's what I'm, yeah. They, how is it that the Bible predicted this stuff now? It's like, it's, it's, they were like spot on about almost everything, huh? Because it's the word wild, of God, man. man. I want this is one of the things I really wanted to get into with you because you're like a recovering addict, you know, like yeah. before your MMA career and your crypto career, you had a whole other world of life, huh? Yeah. Uh, how did you get into MMA or like into how we get into it? How did you get into Christ? How did you get into uh, everything? Yeah. All right. So, yeah, I'll just give you a quick rundown of the story. Um, you could check it out on the Players Tribune. They did a very good article, but, um, you know, basically started out young kid, super energy, um, started wrestling when I was 13. Um, gave my life to the Lord, went on like Russian to, uh, trips to Russia with athletes in action, kind of missionary slash wrestling trips. You know, one was only American to win in Russia um, at this tournament, did duels, went to Siberia, traveled <coughs> around. So, um, but around the age 14, I started to get into a lot of trouble at school, just crazy energy. Parents didn't know what to do. They took me to the doctor, got prescribed Adderall. And um, I come from a long line of addiction. My father, my uncle, my cousins still fighting 
addiction to this day. So instantly hooked, man. And it just kind of gateway into smoking weed, drinking alcohol, doing coke, like very young age, taking ecstasy. Young age, man. It's kind of scary when you think back 15, 16, 17, taking a crazy amount of all different drugs and, you know, fully lost my connection with God. And, you know, even doing all this partying and drugs, I still was a um, three time state champ or no, sorry, two time state champ, one time runner up, a um, couple time All American, fourth at Ironman Nationals, um, a bunch of accolades that and, I was. And still getting high and using. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And um, by the age of 17, I, I fell asleep in my car crashed it missed a sign in a tree by inches and uh it was one of many times that god had spared me and um kind of a wake-up call got sent to rehab shortly after but the thing was is you can look for human help but you have to find help from above and it must come from within to truly find that change you can you can change for a little while but for real change to happen it, it has to be that way so um i got out started using again senior year got expelled um you know, still went to senior nationals, had this rich girlfriend, she paid for everything, partied all year, everyone trained, went there, lost to the champ by two points, wrestled eight matches back and took fourth at senior nationals, was fully attacked by all different scouters trying to get me to come to this school, this school, offered full ride scholarships to D1. And then obviously they saw I was expelled and they're like, all right, you got to go to JUCO first. And uh, wow. so I got a full ride scholarship to Northern Idaho, went out there, got in trouble right away, got arrested, just drinking wild, like... Um, I wrestled, I trained, and then I would party. There was no time for school. So you can imagine it didn't last long. Got sent back to the, um, got kicked out of school, went back to um, Colorado. Came back, man, it was ground zero for me. Like uh, my parents had lost their house. It was 2008, you know, the big recession happened mm -hmm. and the housing market crisis. My parents decided to get a divorce the worst time, tried to sell their house, lost everything. And um, I was just, I was just trying to figure out a way, man. And it's not like I came from nothing. I had some, you know, we were middle to upper class family. So, but then it went from not having nothing. So um, I made my way up to Canada, started working door to door sales, two to four grand a week, crazy money for a young 19 year old kid. Got in, in Canada. Canada, Vancouver, yeah. Oh, uh, but how, what made you, how did you end up in Canada from? So I had a girl, uh, like a girlfriend in high school that moved out there and she wanted me to be her prom date and I didn't have nothing going on. So I was like, yeah, I'll come out there. And she was cool and went out there, ended up splitting up with her, um, moved in with, met this 37 year old chick, moved in with her <laughs> 10 days later, got in all kinds of trouble, beat up her ex-boyfriend and then got, uh, did six months in jail in Canada and got deported back to the States. In a Canadian jail. Yeah. Oh man, how was the Canadian jail like compared to like an American? I, well, I don't know. Have you ever been to American jail? Like, yeah, uh, yeah. Um, surprisingly, it was pretty rough. Like, it was like you definitely. I had to like, you know, I got a knife pulled on me, and then I beat this guy up, and then um, then they kind of gave me respect after that. But it was like, it wasn't terrible, but I mean, it wasn't Rikers Island, but yeah, it was. Yeah. It was uh, I mean, it was a lot of Hell's Angels in there Fuck, and stuff, man. and locked up abroad. That's scary, bro. Yeah, so I got deported back to the States, back to ground zero again, like with, you know, rock bottom. I mean, I didn't have nothing, no degree, no nothing, no anything to do. I met these Guatemalans that were connected with the Mexican cartel, so they started sending me down shipments of ecstasy. <laughs> and I was getting like um, 2,000 pills a week sent in FedEx. And I was going hitting the rave scene with my buddies, and we were just selling them out like crazy. And... You know, it was during that big rave scene, boom, EDM, all that. And yeah, like Molly and st was it like um like uh, the era, like, like the Molly era, like um that's like kinda, the newer one. Yeah, kind of, but it was just like really good ecstasy. Yeah, right? and um, the pills, and they were very cheap in Canada and expensive in Colorado. So about eight months of this, um, got set up in a Walmart parking lot. Had a bad feeling about it, but this chick was driving. She obviously was an informant or something. Um, some sketchy looking dude got in the car, didn't have enough money. I could tell we tried to pull out and go in a McDonald's drive through bam, bam, smash drug task force, jump on the car, pistol to my temple, staring at the blinking Walmart sign. And I was like, man, I'm going to jail for a long time. Um, got locked up. I was looking at two to uh, four to six years. Um, but was able to post bail and just decided, man, I'm 19 years old, just turned 20. Like Damn. there's no way I'm going to prison. And I, so I, I went to the, um, post office got a passport issued to my name somehow 
and hopped on a Greyhound, went to Indiana, said goodbye to my family, hopped on a train, went from Chicago to New York, said goodbye, hopped on a flight, JFK to Amsterdam with about $2,000 in my pocket, and I didn't know anyone. You yeah. just left, like, 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 yo, I'm leaving my charges, everything in, my, in, everything. in, the, in the States. Yeah. Whew, then you just make the commitment, like, yo, you're all in. Like, all right, I'm not coming back, basically. Yeah. So I was kind of hoping for the um, statute of limitations. I heard oh. it was five years, and I heard it was seven years, and I heard I didn't. Like, if you get charged or just from, like, doing a crime and getting caught for the crime, right? Or No, if you, if you don't get charged for five years or maybe seven, okay. it just goes away. Yeah, it was like like, like the credit Statue deal. Of like the, yeah, yeah. Is that, that does it? Yeah. Is that hold up? Is that was it real? Do you were, that's what you were gonna plan to do? Like the seven piece, and then fuck. that's what I was hoping. Yeah. So, um, you know, the police they raided my grandma's house where she lived in New York, but we were staying there and took more drugs, took money, like twenty, thirty thousand dollars cash, just took it all. And all I had was like four grand in a slipper that I owed someone. And I found that. And I was like, that was the only thing they didn't take. Like, it was like the movies where they cut mattresses, ripped every picture off the wall. Um, so I made my way to Amsterdam, ran out of money real quick, just partied, went to Belgium, got a job there for a while, kind of got in trouble, left there, went to England with this crazy English guy, <laughs> ran around, who actually met up with in UFC England, who was on, he made it on the show um, Below Deck. <laughs> But anyways, I made my way around England, and finally ended up in Tenerife, the Canary Islands, and it was paradise. It was the deep. Canary Islands. I've heard about this. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's yeah. like in Europe, right? Like. Uh, yeah, it's like the Cancun of Europe. Okay. Okay. And so I was just walking down the street, and it was beautiful beaches, beautiful women, beautiful uh, just life down there. And I walked up to the club. I was like, "Hey, I'm looking for a job." They're like, "Okay, you're hired," and they basically pay me in drinks. It was like four drinks or eight drinks when I, eight drinks when I worked, four drinks when I got off. And you got one euro per person you brought in the club. So I was like three months of this, bro, full-blown alcoholic. Couldn't even afford 30 euros a, a week for my rent in this room with four other dudes and cockroach infested. And so I was like couch surfing. I was, you know, um, I even slept on the beach a few times on the park bench. So I was like, I was like ground zero, like, like rock bottom. Rock bottom. Yeah, not ground zero, rock bottom. Yeah. And um, it was... Uh, it was kind of a wake up call. There was American there. It was actually from Miami. His dad was Colombian. He said, Hey gringo, like come live with me, man. We don't want to see you live like this. So I moved in with them. We started hitting the gym and going back to the fighting. God had always put it on my heart. Like we used to just watch like Mike Tyson knockouts, like fade or million echo, like YouTube, like pride, like back in the day, like rampage Jackson, like these guys. And it was just like, man, I want to do this. I can do this. I want to do this. And, um, you know, but my addictions and my party and never allowed me to really fully commit and train into the level, even close to the level you need to, to be able to do this. So, um, I was there in about three months of getting sober, hitting the gym. Finally, the dad sent me down. He was like, Hey gringo, let's go make some real money. And I was like, what do you mean? He's like, Colombia gringo, let's go. And so I started taking trips down to Colombia, Venezuela, Aruba, and we were swallowing Coke, about a kilo of Coke each and taking it back. And at first, I was kind of a mule, but then he kind of upgraded me where I could bring my own stuff and, you know, making really good money. And, you know, after about four trips or five trips in Colombia, this black guy in street clothes came up to me. He's like, Dami su pasaporte. And I was like, no, nah, no que prende, sir. And he was like, secret police. And he like checked my password. He's like, oh, yeah, you like Colombia. And I was like, yeah, I got a girlfriend here. You know, he's like, yeah, sit down sat me down to some sketchy looking character and some smoking hot chick. And then we walked in this room like the size of this and had a big x-ray, bro. And ju -ju 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 -ju. walked out. He was like, senor, quiero one dia. And I signed and fingerprinted, bro. And I was like, bah! I was like winning a fight. The adrenaline spike I had after that. Like, oh. but I was like, don't act weird. Oh. Like shaking, you know, like, oh, man. And I uh, got on the plane and my, my other partner was on there. He looked back and I was yeah, man, we're good. And uh, so we just got cocky after that because I was like, what are they going to do? We had this special paper we used to put on the balls that we would swallow. And the Colombians told me it would pass the x-ray. But I was like, these guys are just trying to make yeah, me feel yeah, chill. Like, no, we but, got you. Don't worry. Yeah, yeah. But it was real, man. I passed the x-ray and we got cocky. You know, I was doing trips. We used to do it every three months. Then I was doing it every one month. So it was just finally, bro, so many stamps in that passport. I went from... Aruba to Venezuela, straight to Tenerife, and then I was, I got stopped. They pulled me in an office, questioned me. My girlfriend came, confirmed that she was picking me up, 
and they looked through my wallet, no credit cards, just cash. And they were like, you're rich. Cause I'm like, I'm a rich American. I have girlfriends everywhere. Blah, blah, blah. Played that part. But they were like, eh, went down to the parking garage. The Columbia was waiting for me there. Boom. Drug task force team jumped on me, took us to the hospital, put me on the real x-ray and just could barely see it, man. And bam, I got freaking locked up in Spain. How much can you eat of that? How much of, do you know how much, did you know how much you were eating? Like how much product um, you were eating? We would eat like about a hundred, try to eat around a hundred and they'd be 10 grams each. So, yo, and then, uh, are you, and then you were just muling it? Like they were just paying you for that or do you were yeah, also, so, you were flipping it like that so was, they would, you were just fucking just, just moving it for them, huh? Well, they would, they would pay me like seven grand for the first run. And then I would like bring half for my own. So I'd like bulk sell it. And I would go to the club because I worked at the club. So I'd be selling it there, making banks. So, like, oh. I mean, we're spending like 1200 bucks on a kilo, and you could sell it for like 76,000 euros. In foreign countries. And yeah. you're just traveling on so the road. And you're just living on the road. What? And you're just living on the road, basically. Like, basically, yeah, just traveling. We party for, we'd still always stay a month because it doesn't look sketch. Yeah. And we'd party for two weeks, get sober for one week, and then wrap it up the last week and dip out. Wow. Yeah, man. And then you were saying, so when we got sloppy, and what happened when you... Uh... So just too many stamps for my passport, too many trips, and they finally took me in the airport and took me on the real x-ray where the plaque's there, they leave the room, and and uh, yeah, man, I sat in prison for a year and a half with no court hearing, no nothing, and I was just in like... In Spain? Yeah, and you could sit up to four years. Bro... And then, like, uh, no, you don't speak Spanish? Everybody's just speaking Spanish in there, I guess, and Everyone stuff like this? Everyone was speaking Spanish. Um, Yo aprendido español. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Say, what kind of people were, like, were you, like, with all types of people? Or is it, like, uh, were you, like, in a drug dealing section? Or is it just, like, nah, foreigners? everything, bro. It's, it's got to be nuts. Like, they don't give a shit. And it's not like, a, there's no laws, right? I'm sure it's less regulation Bro, overseas. it was actually 100% better than American <laughs> Oh, it's Europe, street though. Clothes, so street clothes. Street clothes. Dude, there was the second day, so you'll, you'll never believe this story. It was like one of the first days in this mod. Because I got, first I was in like the beginning where it's like the bad, and I stayed out of trouble for a month, and then they moved me to like more of a respect one where like you get more privileges. Uh, the guy comes up, we're doing Lucha Canaria, and that's like they're wrestling. They do it in a gi, shoulder to shoulder, it's kind of Senegalese style. They lock up there, best out of three takedowns in a sand gladiator pit, and you have to run through the whole team. And you know me, dude. Like, my wrestling, I was just like... You're and I rolled up, your whole life. I rolled up and you usually have to put in an estancia and, like, wait three months. And I rolled up right to the coach, and I was like, bro. And he's like... And he took me first day. And, dude, I smoked the whole prison. <laughs> then we had a team come in from that was paid. They would make, like, two to four grand. Like, it was their profession. Yeah. And me and one other crazy American who wrestled <laughs> in high school, we wrecked their team. We won it. And they put us in the newspaper, which I'll send you some B-roll on that. Yeah. Um, so they put us in the newspaper, and it was, like, American uh, beat the Canarians. And they and they trained me a lot. Like, Canarians were good. And, and then another team came in and I got beat. These guys were big. Like, it was no weight classes. You, yeah. would, you would start with the smallest and you'd work your way up to the biggest. And they had different techniques. They'd sweep you and stuff like that. But with like a gi type thing? Yeah, it was and a gi. And they're like grabbing the gi like, like with shoulder judo throws shoulder, and stuff? You roll up the gi right here and you lock your hand. They lock your hand. And you sit right here and you, and you go. And then you can like let go. And I would, I would double, do double legs. legs and yeah, I would legs. double legs. And, um, Dude, I loved it, man. It made me fall back in love with wrestling. And it's crazy. The coach was Juan Espino. And, um, or Trota. His name was Trota. And his son, Juan Espino, is a UFC fighter. Right now. He was the best to ever do Lucha Canaria. This episode of the Honey Badger Hour podcast is brought to you by the original Clippers Barbershop. Located on 14227 south dixie highway make an appointment today you can find them on the booksy booking app or call 305-964-7882 more than 20 plus years in the game and that's the original clippers barbershop master barbers for a master fighter so his dad was locked up and became my coach and juan espino in the ufc he just retired from injuries but he was like the legend. He did very well. He won the Ultimate Fighter heavyweight. Okay. 
Wow. And um, so it was like crazy. And I got to meet him out here. He trains out here. He lives out. He trained out here. I'm, he's back in the Canary Islands. But so it was like crazy, bro, that I got to train under him, fell back in love with wrestling. And at the time, I thought, this is what I'm going to do. I was like, I love doing this. How old were you when you were there? Like about in the... Were you um, sentenced already or? No, I hadn't been sentenced yet. I was... Wow. Um, I was 24 to 26. So you're still young, dog. Like, you still feel good. You had like, and yo, you've been like an athlete your whole life wrestling. Oh, and just, you're kind of like your addiction is what kind of kept you out from probably reaching your potential. Cause bro, you're winning these tournaments yeah. off of doing benders and just going and winning and like having all these matches, you know? Yeah. So like you always had it in you, you know? Yeah. It's just the discipline probably like in the, it was. Di- oh my and gosh. That's what, like, man, like just like a message for someone. Like when I got locked up, it was the worst thing that I felt could ever happen to me in my life. And now looking back, it was the best thing that could have ever happened. So I know a lot of people are struggling with um, things that feel like it's the end of the world. But, man, there's some a blessing behind that. And I went in there. I kind of rekindled my relationship with Christ. God was really working on me. Not only did they have a wrestling program, they had a kickboxing program. And they had the champ of K1 from Spain in there. And, boy, did he beat me up good. And then I was like, bro, let me teach you some wrestling because you want to do MMA. And I was like, teach me some striking. So we kind of trade it off. In the jail. What kind of what kind of gear do they have? Do they have gear and stuff? Or, and um, they have mats or what do you guys like wrestling mats or something? Or? No, we 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 sparred on the cement floor. Like, or grass. Do have you ever get yard time and shit? Like um, No, it was all cement. Wow. So we would sprawl and there'd be bars and stuff everywhere. And like it was it was uh it was very gladiator like, but you know, it was it was what I needed, man. And then I was like I told even the newspaper interviewed me. I was like, I've done wrestling. I've done all this. But my favorite thing is Lucha Canaria. I want to stay here. I really wanted to stay there. And when I wanted, I, I petitioned to stay in there, get released there, and get on a professional team. Because the Federation of Lucha Canaria, the president, wrote the warden a letter and said, hey, we want to recruit this American. When he's free, we want him here. A lot of people might not know, but... Spanish people, some of them, are very, like, racist to, like, Americans. Like, they're like, he's not one of us, blah, blah, blah. It was, like, wild. Like, like I felt that, you know? And, yeah. and uh, one day, they told me don't do an interview again. And I did another interview. And she came, and th- this nasty lady threw the bag. And she's like, pack your stuff. You're out of here. And I was like, what? And so I started, like, hucking chairs. I was so mad because I had, I had no contacts, like, um, I had needed contact lenses. My vision was so bad. And my girlfriend finally stopped having visits with me. Um, and I had a buddy who was bringing me my contacts, but then they con aired me to the north of Spain. And it was like two weeks, bro. No contact with anyone, moving me to all these. And it would be like, they'd throw me in with like terrorists and like, it was like a lot of like Moroccans and like all different parts of the say, world. Yeah, I was gonna say but, like a lot of international people in those jails. Yeah, yeah. like I was like on a flight. And they don't have, like, prison flights, so they charter regular flights. So these dudes roll up with black ski masks on. And, bro, like, they make you walk up. You're shackled like this. They make you walk, open your mouth. They jam the glove in your mouth. Like, reach it. Like, have you seen Con Air? Yeah. It was just like it. And I was with these two Bermudan guys. And, and you go on a plane with regular people? Or No. Okay, all okay. prisoners. Oh, so it's Con Air. Like, real Con Air. Con Air. Oh, my God. So, dude, we're on this plane, bro. And... Um, shackled, shackled up and if you look up they whack you like hard and as we're landing on the flight bro I had to dude we just saw Con Air a couple weeks I was like he's got the whole world in his hands and bro they beat me up for like like a minute not too bad but like <laughs> jab me and I was like worth it and I, I heard the other guy in the front laughing because he knew exactly what I was doing and um, it was wild bro we like rolled up to, to this prison in Spain and like there was guys that would be like locked up there in grade three where they would have like 23 hour lockups. And like these, these guys, like when we landed, the gangster police left that you did not want to mess with with the ski mask on. Then we rolled up to the Guardia Seville, which is like the National Guard. And they're like, you, habla Castellano, like puta Canarias. Like they were like, 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 like speak our language, you freaking Canarians. Like speak Spanish correctly. And we're like just dogging on. And dude, uh, kicked off his shoes, just got on handcuffed and like went at him, bro. And they beat him up. They took a nightstick, hit him in the head, cut his ear. Like I saw his ear hanging. So it was wild, man. I finally made it to this place called Lyon, Spain. 
and they had a boxing program there and there was like this champ like this like old guy like small but he was like a, like a champ someone i don't even know <laughs> dude and he was just all about it so i made my way up to the respect mod and i did two boxing classes a day so i did about three hours of boxing a day and they had like fights bro and like sparring matches in the prison and like it like it was good man i got really good and you know i had an encounter with god because right when i got there some dude stepped in on me and i blasted him right off the bat because you know that's what you got to do make a name yeah. like let people know you they can, they're not gonna be able to punk you and um uh can i use that as a spitter oh yeah, yeah my man. you're good and then um so i got put in isolation for two weeks and I was like 10 days in, bro. No human contact. Oh, just, like, they, you had to like freaking let them know real quick. And then. Yeah, I had to let them know. I got put in isolation. And I was just losing my mind, bro. Like I was just like counting the cracks in the room, rolling up my bed, doing yoga, like all this weird talking to myself, crazy. And um, finally, dude, I just broke down. I had a Bible in Spanish. And I just was like, Lord, if you're real, like reveal yourself to me. And I opened the Bible and, and I started reading Genesis. And I read Spanish like it was my first language. Like I understood everything. Like it was like, and I felt this fire in my chest ignite. And I just felt this peace come upon me, like the Holy Spirit. And I was just like, thank you, Lord. Like just tears rolling down my eyes. Just like, and I finally felt like a peace. And I thought you would think a counter like that would make you turn. But I still had more tribulations even when I got out. I did my two and a half years. And then I got extradited back to the States. And they only extradite you to the closest state, which was New York. So I landed in New York, scanned my passport, beep. And they're like, sir, how long have you been out the country? I was like, oh, a while. They're like, how long? I was like, five years. And they're like, yeah, come with us. And my warrant popped up. And they had no idea because even when I got locked up, they were like, do you want to contact the U.S. Embassy? And I was like, nah, we're good. Because I didn't want them to know about my felony <laughs> drug warrants that I had. And so... I sat in a Jamaica Yo. Queens jailhouse for three days over the weekend. Terrible, bro. Just on a weekend, bro. Just like pimps and heroin addicts. And just, it was, everyone was puking. It was so gross, bro. And like, you just came from a foreign jail. Yeah. And, um, and I sat there and then I got taken to court and they're like, you're going to Rikers Island without bail. And my lawyer comes, she's like, you need to go to protect custody. She's like, white boys don't go in there. It's crazy in there. And I'm like, I've been in, and I didn't even know what Rikers was. I was like, I was like, I've been, I've been locked up so long. I was like, throw me up the wolves. So I'll lead the pack. Like, I'm not going to protect the custody. We call it punk city. <laughs> and I was like, I'm not going there. And so, but then we're going down this long road, man. And it's like gate after gate. And I'm like, yo, this is a real Island. Like I Rikers didn't realize it was an Island, bro. And we got in there, man. And like, I was in maximum security because I was a fugitive, and it was just, it was the hardest month and a half of prison that I went through. And then that was your term? It was just a month and a half for, every, a month, for, for the term? So the a month one. and a half in there, I got in a, dis a dispute with one of the gangs. Luckily, I spoke Spanish pretty fluent, so I got kind of cool. It was like the, the scary moment where you had like the Latin Kings and the other gang. And oh, like, yeah. And I'm like, at, with, I'm at lunch, like, and they're like, yo, gringo, ven baca. And I like sat with them. I was like, thank God, bro. Like, and uh, I kind of became cool with one of the leaders. His name was Fingers. He was, like, missing a couple fingers. And uh, he was cool, man. And I got into a dispute with the other guys. And, you know, they came at me with a knife. One guy did. He, like, he said he wanted to fight. And he saw me shadow boxing myself because I'd just been training. I trained yeah. for two and a half years. Boxing everything, right? I turned my body into a weapon. Like, that was my goal. My goal was to do three things every day. Train spiritually, physically, and mentally. So I would get right with God. I was reading the Bible. I was going to church. I had my little Bible study. I was reading books for my mind. And then physically, every day, just training, training, training. And I was just, that's why I got my name, The Hurricane, because I don't know if you've seen the movie. From Patterson, yeah, The Hurricane, the, the boxer hurricane. who got yeah. falsely. I love yeah. that. Yeah, great So movie. he did two years in prison, came out, was a world champ. Obviously, the other stuff happened, you know. But, um, so, you know, this guy saw me shadow boxing, and finally... It was terrible, bro. They would be like, you have court. And to go to court, you got to shackle, walk in the line, pull your pants down, bend over and cough, get in the bus, go to this holding and cell. And it's mad cold, right? Nasty. They got to sit in the oh. bus, like that freezing bus. I always tell me that freezing bus. Like oh, when yeah. you go to court, it's like 4 in the morning, right? 4, 3 in the morning or yeah, something? Yeah, it was terrible, bro. They did this three times. No lawyer, no judge. And I'm like, yo, what are these guys doing? And they're like, highness, you're going to court. I'm like, I ain't going nowhere. 
And Fingers is like, bro, they're going to come and tase you. And they came back with tasers. Like, all right, I'm going to go. I'm not, you know, I'm not going to get tased over this. And so I went, came back. I was in a real bad mood, kind of mouthed off to one of, like, the head guys in the other gang. And he's like, meet me in the back. And so I was like, all right, this dude wants to scrap. Big dude. And I'm like, all right, let's do this. Pulls out a nasty shank, bro. And he's like, in my face with it. And I was like, bro, I don't want no problems, man. Please. And boom, I blasted him. And then all his boys came running up. And that's when these Latin kings got in the way. And they were like, yo, this white boy with us, homie. And, you know, they protected me at that time. We went to our cells. Everything kind of calmed down. And they were like, you need to go to protect custody, bro. They're going to get you. They got an SOS on you. And I was like, what's that? And they're like, stab on sight. And I was like, oh, bro. Oh. And so I called the guard over, and I was like, bro, I got to get out of here. They're going to kill me. And he was like, F you, white boy. Boom, slam the door. And Rikers Island, dude, is it, like people were dying. All it's still like, like that. It's still like that. It needs to get closed down. If you haven't seen watch the Khalif Broder documentary done by Jay-Z, and you will see like the true colors of Rikers. They need to shut that place down. Because the, the guards are in on it. That's what I'm saying. The guards are the biggest gangsters, huh? Yeah. There. Yeah. And so, I mean, this was another time God saved me, man. I stayed up all night praying. I knew they were going to open that cell door. They're going to rush me. The guards are going to let it. And, you know, two big football player dudes came at my door. And I was like, yo, like up all night making, like, I was like putting my bed up on the wall. I had like all my sheets off to like shove in my, to make like armor. And oh. uh, did you have a roommate or like you had like your no, you're your, all by so you're yourself all, in Rikers? Everybody has their own cell block, the or only like... maximum security. Oh my god! And so, um, yeah, they came in and they were like, Heinish, and I jumped up and they were like, looked at my because all my room was destroyed. And they were like, uh, I was like, Who are you guys? They're like, U.S. Marshal. And I was like, Oh my gosh. And they were like, Do you have any possessions or anything we need to get? I was like, Nope, let's go. I had all my stuff there, but I was like, Dude, I want to get out of here. Yeah. And so they took me out and that the next 14 days were probably some of the hardest too they shackled us up like this in these vans and the first van i was on the heater was broke and it was february in the east coast and they drove us in circles 48 hours we're back in new york and i was like bro we went to pennsylvania to vermont back to new york i guess they get paid when they cross borders and drop people off so we circled the country like this bro and like they're every 72 hours they're required to put you in a jail to let you sleep but the problem is they put me down. I would lay down and they'd be like, Heinish, you're on the next bus. And so I'd have to go again. So I didn't sleep for like 10 days, bro. Like I was like hallucinating. Like I was like bouncing up and down like this. Like it was like, it was really bad. And finally, dude, I made it. Jefferson County. Got Finally made it to this jail. Slept there for two days. My mom bailed me out. And uh, it was 2014 Valentine's Day. I was free, man, for the first time in about two, two years and eight months. Wow, 2014. Yeah. I feel like that was not too long. Oh, my God, man. Yep. And where did you go? You went back to Colorado? Where were your parents? You went back yeah, with so your I parents? Yeah, I was in Colorado. Yeah. Yep, I stayed with my parents. Um, it was kind of funny. I went from all Spanish and Moroccans to, like, all, like, Latins and, and African American, then to all white boys. And then I went straight downtown to Denver, and my dad took me to a yoga festival. And I'm in there laughing because it's just all these chicks, bro. And I hadn't seen girls in a while. So I was just laughing. It was kind of like a surreal moment. And people were looking at me. I'm like, you have no idea. <laughs> oh, my and, God. Uh, so I knew the common denominator of me getting in trouble was alcohol. Always alcohol. And I did break a couple times drinking. I did a little bit of coke. Um, but I went to a church, and they were kind of like asking for money. And I'm like, dude, I don't need the church, man. I'm like, you know, I am the church, blah, blah, blah. I don't need a community, which is a complete lie. Um, and I knew I, I found a gym and I started training and the coach was like very structured and very strict. And I needed that in my life at that time. In Colorado? In Colorado at Factory X. Yeah. Okay. And I, I, I have a friend that is still around. Yeah. I think yeah. I have a friend who's there. That's dope, man. What's his name? Uh, Jonathan, but I don't think he's just like a student. I don't think he's a fighter, you know? Okay. But. So no, so that you found a gym or you just looked it up online and stuff like this, like. Um no, a buddy that I used to wrestle with, um, hit me up. He's like, hey, I'm going to this gym training MMA, and I was like, I was like, cool man. I was like, you cool if I get a ride? I had no license, you know, I had no money, and he gave me a ride. And the day he quit, I got my license back, so I didn't even miss a day, man. It was wild. The day he quit the gym. Yeah, and so. You know, I went 4-0 as an amateur, then I turned pro, then I went 8-0 as a pro. 
made it to the fight, the pinnacle. You win this fight, you go to the UFC, LFA title. And a year before this, I had tore my knee right before a fight. I went to the doctor, got prescribed 40 Percocet. Instantly hooked, man. It was this vicious cycle of like, I would take all of these pills and then I was taking oxy, sniffing it. I was buying off the street, going to Mexico, getting it. And, um, you know, it was a really, it was a bad cycle, man. I couldn't quit. And I would quit three weeks before a fight. I would get deathly ill for a week from the, re, uh, from the withdrawals. Then I would feel better and then I will go fight. And then, of course, to celebrate, I would take more. Yeah. It was this vicious, vicious cycle that I was in. And when you're not living right outside yeah, of the octagon... It always shows in the cage. And I went in there, didn't wasn't myself, got submitted the first round. This is for the LFA for the, for the LFA, LFA title, title fight. So once again, bro, your addiction, you were still making it just in spite of your addiction. You're fighting, right? Like you like you're in college, you like you you you're still wrestling and stuff like this, you know what yeah. I mean? And like and you're still making it happen, you know? And then so your MMA career was kinda like similar, you know? Like it was kinda yeah. like wow. But then I lost the fight, and you know, your first fight you lose is always the hardest. And I it's took like it really good. hard, bro. And I went on this camping trip, just wanted to hurt myself. Took my buddy on this crazy hike, 60 mile hour winds. We almost died of hypothermia. I was just like, keep going, keep going. And chopped wood till my hands bled. And finally, man, just like it rained for like a day. So we just were in the car, and we were way up in the mountains in Leadville. And my buddy had given him this Bible study, and, um, I had been going to church and had been going to Bible study, but I was still taking drugs and, and fornicating and doing these things, and I couldn't break this cycle. And so I read this Bible study, man, and first it just challenged and said, like, are you really saved? Like, And we were like, we got offended. We were like, these dudes don't think we're like really saved? And then it just hit me like a ton of bricks. Like, man, you're living as a hypocrite, man. Yeah. And right then, man, I fully submitted my life to God and, um, you know, the next week we went to church, or it was like three weeks later we went to church, and it was a baptism call. I had no idea, and I felt God pulling on my heart. I went there. I got baptized. I felt like the water was clear when I walked in, or I saw it clear. And when I turned back and looked, and when I got out, it looked black. And I felt like God was like, there's your addiction. There's your old self dead. And at that time, I was broke, living in my buddy's basement, not in the UFC, single, and I never paid taxes in my life. One year after that, I had met my wife, married her. Broke into the, uh, got in the UFC, broke into the top 10, bought our first house, and I was a taxpaying citizen for the first time in my life. And not to say when you become a Christian or when you give your life to the Lord that everything's sunshine and rainbows, because that's not true. But this, that way, when you go through those trials and tribulations, which you'll still have, even maybe more, you'll have someone to go there in the fire with you. Yeah, so it's kind of like your rock, huh? Yeah. Wow, man. What a change, bro. And then you were already like, so you were already like close to the, you were already close, you know, like you were already there on the cusp, you know? So that was like the, that, that loss had to be the best thing that happened to you because it was kind of like a blessing in disguise, oh, yeah. you know? Oh, yeah. Because imagine if you would have won that fight still getting banged up. You would have, it would have been, a, if you get, if you would have got signed that after that, it's like you would have got there, but it would have been like you were maybe like, yeah, you maybe more mentally ready, you know? <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. So then I. That's heavy, bro. After, after that loss, I. Had a knockout first round in Arizona LFA. Then I had fought for the LFA title again, knocked him out. Then I fought on Contender Series, knocked him out. So I went on three knockout streak right after that. Then I got a short notice fight to fight Cesar Ferreira in um, uh, Argentina. I found out on Friday, I left on Sunday to Argentina, fought the next Saturday, and um, and I, I won. A, in a crazy decision, and it was a war. It was like a short notice fight. How was your cardio? So your Short notice fight, he had to make middleweight? Yeah. Oh, what was your weight? It was like tough weight, weight cut, everything? Um, like 203, 205. So back then I didn't, I wasn't that heavy. I didn't gain a bunch of weight in between. I was training hard. So I was ready, man, because everyone was ducking me in Denver when we were supposed to, when the fights came there because of the elevation. And oh, I just true. couldn't get a fight. So I was like telling the USC, I was like, give me anyone, let's go. And at the time, Cesar was probably in the top 20. And then I took another short notice fight, about three and a half weeks uh, to fight Antonio Carlos Jr. We got bumped to the co-main event in Rochester, New York, and uh, I won that fight. So my second fight in the UFC, I was ranked number nine. Two in the wins. World. Two wins in the UFC. And both short. They like when you do short notice, right? Like they appreciate you and stuff like this. Like yeah, uh, absolutely. They they were like this dude's game. So then I I you know I started to 
you know, then I had this other fight. Then I fought Derek Brunson after that, who was like number seven at the yeah. time. And, you know, I mean, no excuses. I lost a close decision, but this is the time my thyroid started really messing me up. I blew up like 10 pounds. The weight cut became harder. I was real lethargic. And I had like a flare up the week of the fight where I was just like, and I started getting these skin infections too, where um, it would be like zits, but they call it folliculitis. And then it would turn into staph. And with stress, it would get worse. So then antibiotics, 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 Just antibiotics. Like Next it, yeah. thing you know, my stomach was so wrecked, bro. I had blood in my stool for a year. I fought, um, I fought Omari Akhmedov, and um, you know, I lost another close decision, which I, you know, I, I felt like I won, and I felt like I just didn't have the gas that I used to have, and. Uh, you know, I was having some serious health issues. No excuses. Like, those guys are tough, and I uh, fought a good fight. Yeah, high-level guys, you know? Like, yeah, and, I mean, and top stud 10. grapplers, you know? Like, yeah. Um, so. And, um, yeah, so I, you know, I lost that fight, and that's when I was like, you know, I need to make some changes, and that's when I went to Thailand. When you went to Thailand, you you didn't go with you went solo dolo right? Did you, you went with your, I was went, Mark was I went, uh, Nate was Nate Nate Marquardt yeah. So I went out there for a month to try it out. Then my wife came the second month, and then we came back home. I had her quit her job. We put our house up for rent, and then we moved out there. Wow. Hey, how did you like living out there compared to oh. what was it like training in America compared to the training environment in Thailand yeah, as a UFC fighter? Because I yeah. know from the low level, but I went there and started my career there, right? So. It's gonna be like as like you've already seen the game here in in America, right? Yeah, man, I loved it, bro. I was really upset that the whole. I mean, you can live like a king on such a budget. You know, in America, bro, everything costs so much money, bro. It's like it never ends. You know, you're just in a rat race just to make your pay your bills. There's so much to do, but then you're just always thinking about like I gotta pay this, I gotta pay that. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah insurance yeah. and this. I got like that. 25 jobs right now. So. Yeah, and. <laughs> So it just, it was slower. It was more disconnected. It was high level training. It was, it was very hot. So you kind of had to get used to that like crazy um, heat. You know, you chug so much water and uh, you eat like a king. You get massages every day. The massages, bro. And like sauna, you go to like sauna Wednesday. You could do like the MMA technique class with George. Like Wednesday would be like our midday. Like, the sh like you do wrestling Tuesday, Thursday. Yeah. So you get the sauna Wednesday, like at seven o'clock. Have a good yeah. meal. Oh, yeah. you're bringing me back, bro. So then, so then COVID came. I went back to Denver. That's and right. I was like, dude, like, why? And we were training underground, going to the back of gyms. And yeah, this was like the two weeks they, the whole world shut down. And, um, Oh, so I'm, you left Thailand in the pandemic. Sorry. Yeah, they, right. yeah. It was like, I was there. It was weird to stay. It was like, you had to make a, t a tough call, right? Yeah, like, like, either you stay and you're stuck. That's like, literally, it was. Trump came on. He's like, you got 72 hours to get back to the States, and they're going to shut everything down. And I was like, bro, like, I got to go. Yeah. Like, and so I went back. My wife was still working out her last couple of weeks of work, and then we were, she was going to, we were renting our house out. And, um, so I came back. We, you know, had the pandemic at our house. I trained. My manager kept saying, "Be ready, bro. The UFC is gonna come back. They're they're gonna be the first. Like, they were the first ones. My fight got canceled, and then I I ended up getting that fight with um, uh, Gerald Mearshart. Yes. Went out there, got a first round knockout. Oh, that was a nasty one, bro. Yeah. I saw that. That was in the freaking beginning. Was that in where was that was in Apex or Jackson? No, that was in Apex. Apex. Overeem, who was the main event that card? I watched that fight. Oh, that was a nasty knockout, bro. What yeah, was the main event of um, that fight? Fuck. Is it Poirier? It was Hooker? USC 241. Was it Poirier Hooker, bro? No. It Man, wasn't. we need a young Jamie right now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> For real. Dude, what was it? Dog, you fought in the beginning. That was like crazy watching it on TV. Yeah. It felt like we were doing, I felt like we were watching something wrong. It was like watching UFC 1. Like, oh my God, what's happening here, you know? Yeah. Remember the the Dana White was getting so much slack for putting on fights and stuff. Yeah, it was it was kind of annoying though. Like we had to get locked down and wear masks. I remember, like, bro. I mean, whatever they had to do, what they had to do. But like fight week used to be so fun. Your whole crew would come out. Yes. And you'd be in nice hotels and you do fun stuff on fight week. Now you're just sitting in this room, which is okay. You're with your coaches, but it just had that didn't have that same effect, bro. And it's then like, like I knocked out Jeremy Mishra and it was like. Like three claps, yeah, bro. Yeah, you're, you're like, like oh, you're screaming to yeah, nobody, bro. Yeah, ah. <laughs> and it was just such anticlimactic because then you just go to your hotel. There's nothing really open, so you're just like, all right, time to go home. It was just yeah. weird, bro. And then and the I 32 never COVID tests. Of a crowd, and I feed off the crowd, bro. And uh, my last two fights, I fought Kelvin Gastelum at the freaking Apex, and I fought same thing. Abdulmetov at the Apex, and you've been stuck in the Apex since, yeah, bro. Yeah. Oh my gosh, and now you got. The, oh. 
hey, listen, wow, so how did you, you like the crowds? And then I always ask people, like, how do they, how do they, I always ask the fighters, like, how did you guys feel, like, with the energy? Like, you feel like the, some people like it. Some people like some to fight with the do, no crowd, bro. right? Isn't it weird? It's, I feed off the energy. It, it, it more feels like sparring. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. Like you walk in and you're just like, oh. Like compared to when you walk, that curtain opens in, you're just like, ah. And you just like, I just like feed off that. Some people don't. Exactly. Yeah, that's what Hooker was saying. He's like, oh, okay. He's like, look, there's 15 people in here. You know what I mean? That's what he was saying. Like, exactly. Like, you walk out and it's just like, you got to, like, wake yourself up, you know? Yeah. I fought in the uh, Singapore Arena and for 1FC. I fought in the big in the big arena and same thing. Uh, seven days lockdown in the hotel, 32 COVID tests, you know, like, you're doing training camp. Like, the lady walks you down to the gym. You can, like, work out for an hour and then she walks you back up to the hotel, you know? And then same thing, right? You go into like it's like a big <laughs> and like you're walking. It was like an empty arena and it's just the ring, you know. And then like, you still do the walkout and stuff. So it was surreal, man. It's weird. It was surreal, like bro. It. The lockdown, the like, was crazy, man. The like, pandemic, it kind of like shifted everybody's careers a little bit, you know. Like we all had yeah. to make moves and stuff like that, you know, and changes, yep. right? Yep, we did, man. So it kind of broke everyone up. And so after Colorado, I was like, dude, I didn't like leave my gym to stay in Colorado, but I had a really good coach out there. But I was like, yo, and that's when I moved to Vegas. Vegas was like the lost city for all the fighters. Like a lot of people from Thailand, like that's uh, right. Um, Casey, was Casey's out. still there. Yeah, now. Casey's out there. Um, let me think who else. There was a lot. It was like. Did you go to Extreme Couture? Yeah. Were you there with Strickland? Was he yep. like running the show? He's, he was he like the team captain then too when you were going over there? Um, not quite yet. He was kind of in the come up. Oh, so okay, yeah, that's right. All right, so the pandemic, then you start fighting. You were training. You went to then went to Vegas to start training for the pandemic. Yeah. And stuff like that. Uh, how was that like? Oh, how Vegas was kind of open like Miami or what? Yeah, kinda. Yeah, it was still it's still kind of like liberal, so it was, it was pretty shut down. But oh, that's right, gyms were open and, and stuff. Mad homeless people, dog. Everywhere you go, where it's super liberal, is mad home. I went to Vegas. This shit is crazy, bro. Yeah, it's super. Ghetto. That's a wild place, right? Yeah. Oh my god. But there's nice areas, and it's it's there's a lot more to do than the strip. You know, there was like, you know, uh, you got the river, the Colorado River. There, beautiful. You got Mount Charleston. You got red rocks and there's a lot of nice stuff right around there that you can do like nature wise but yeah man so it, i went there and it was just you know i just felt like um i don't know man i didn't i wanted like the beach i wanted just a different environment and just something similar to thailand and that's when i moved to florida and i got injured shortly after fought alma Manoff, came back got injured and you know fell in love with it out here and been fighting these injuries done stem cells you know, NAD pushes, been doing um, all different types of supplements to try to help, um, hyperbaric chamber, Dynavision, um, stem on the head, all this different stuff, man. And I'm still doing some good treatment out at FHE Medical. They really okay. helped me out. Have you ever done any, like, um, psychedelic mushrooms or anything like that? Yeah, like, so I'll do uh, microdosing. Or, like, or something, you know what I mean? Or, yeah, or microdosing. Not even, oh, really? Okay, yeah. that, I, hope, I hope that helps, like, rewire, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, that's helped a lot. Um, my, when you microdose the mushrooms, just, like, a certain level, like, you got to be really careful because a little bit too much, you're like, whoa. Yeah, you don't want to do that. But that microdose, if you find that sweet spot, it's like, whoa, you're, like, really on it. You know what I mean? You feel like you're firing off on all cylinders, huh? That's interesting. Yeah. Have you ever tried to train on it? No. On the mushrooms and stuff? No. No, okay, yeah, that's another thing. I feel like my heart would get like real crazy. Yeah, I don't want like I don't I the amount I took I would just kind of feel like a little bit of a body high maybe and just sleep really good and uh, okay. kind of feel a reset in the morning, you know. Oh, so you do it like a night like a like a chill out. Yeah. Oh, because some people take microdose and they go about their day and like they go train and yeah. do stuff and go to work and do meetings. I'm like, that's you know what I mean? Yeah, I don't know. But it's the waves and that stuff. It gets crazy, you know. Yeah. But then they have like all different types of mushrooms, like um, like lion's mane, and like they have like a bunch of. I like, do all that stuff. Yeah. Like they got like that Chaga. fruiting body podcast in Thailand, and that guy is selling all types of different mushrooms that are like good for the brain and. Yeah, you know? yeah, absolutely. CBD mushrooms, all that I've been trying. There's something about the medicine, bro. Like, they say that it's, like, herb medicine. Like, they call it, like, Western. Like, they call it, like, Chinese medicine. But before, like, the FDA and all that stuff and the Rockefellers, like, when they were able to, like, make aspirin and Tylenol, that was, like, the real medicine. That's, like, the natural. That's, like, the, the real medicine of thousands and thousands of years of humanity. And now, just recently, since, like, the 40s, they call it, like, weird Chinese medicine. But... Really, we're the, I think we're the the West. I think we're the ones with all the like you were saying with the pills and stuff, bro. Isn't that crazy that you're a kid and you have a lot of energy and the first thing they want to tell you is like, yo, take Amphetamine. Adderall. And then and, and then you have a personality, bro. Like yeah. And then I was 17 and um, I was so wired up from Adderall and I had anxiety. They gave me Xanax. 
These fucking doctors, bro. It's like they're so smart, they're dumb. I swear to God. It's like, yo, give them this, give them that. Yeah. What is it, bro? I really want to know, man, because it's like, how do I know more? And then they'll talk shit about us, right? Like, if you start talking about the farmer's schools, I'm like, oh, look at this guy. Oh, UFC guy thinks he's a doctor now. I was like, I don't know, bro. I'm just like, I know my body pretty trial well. Trial and error, yeah. Yeah, it's like it's trial and error, dog. It's like, yo, especially living in Thailand where you kind of kind of self-diagnose yourself. You just go to the pharmacy and, like, you got to see what's wrong. Yeah. So then these guys to be like... Yeah, I feel like there's a war on humanity with the drug with the drug oh, company. Oh yeah, they want to they want to give you something that treats your symptoms, and then um, they want to and make... not even treat. What do they call it? They want to they want to numb your symptom. Yeah, they don't want to address your symptoms. They want to address the no, no they the wanna, symptoms, not they, the problem. Yeah, they don't want to go to the root cause. That's why I recommend anyone going to uh, functional medicine. They go after the root cause using diet supplements and sometimes pharmaceuticals if they need it for a short time. But not just one pill that helps this um, symptoms, but then that pill is gonna give you these effects, and then you need another pill for that, and it's just an endless thing. They want us on pills our whole life. They want us on all pills the whole life, and I got a and I got a theory with that, and that thing with and like the whole thing that's going on with the transgender and everything like this, and and the switching of the of the governments and all, like bro. If, if a kid gets on some type of thing, I always say, this is what I was saying before, as I'm telling everybody, I was like, yo, if you get on some type of surgery, like hormone replacement, that's a, that's a client for life. You know? Yeah. So it's like, oh, yeah. these fucking, they just want to make sure that you're on it forever, you know? Yeah. And same thing with like the aspirin and stuff, bro. They got like, they're talking about autism and things like this. It's like, it's kind of new, bro. You know what I mean? Like, you think back in the day, there wasn't too many, like nowadays, it's true. I have a, like, I'm in like in the era now where a lot of my friends are having kids. And a lot of people's kids have, like, some type of issue, you know? Yeah, yeah. And I feel like we're in the cancer age now, bro. I was just telling you before in the podcast, my buddy passed away from cancer. And, like, we're at the age now where I know a lot of healthy people, like, strong, athletic guys. And they're just all types of cancers is coming up at that age, you know? Yeah, man. I mean, our food's poison. Our food's poison, bro. You saw that um, Putin wants to take out all GMOs from yeah. the food. yeah. So they got one guy trying to take out GMOs and make his country healthy. And then the other guy, they got Bill Gates trying to make fake meat, bro. That's like... Yeah. And that shit's got... Who, who knows what kind of poison it is? They're trying to get us off. It is crazy, bro. Oh, There's yeah. a war of humanity, bro. Oh, I know. It's I know. wild, man. Yeah, we're in some crazy times. And I feel like right now is the most important time. Like, for a long time, I was quiet and I was just kind of like... But now, I don't care, bro. I'll, I'll just say whatever I'm feeling. I'm not going to be embarrassed because that's no. what they want. They want to you, bro. They want you to take away don't your backbone. Shut up. And like this, this, just like they wanted, and this is why I'm getting into into a religion now. That's why I was so excited to talk to you about this, bro. Like, and I'm like now I'm understanding why. Like I used to always kind of not shit on God, but I always just used to be like, I don't know, like young minded. Maybe like the yeah. listening to Joe Rogan or something. Like they were just making fun of religion. But then I'm like, wow. The older I get, the more it makes sense, you know. And the more like yeah, everything adds up, you know. It's like, yeah, if you don't have like, there's got to be a God because there's definitely a devil, bro. Oh, yeah. There's you, a goddamn can, devil. You, I see it every day moving back to America, bro. Oh, yeah. He's not, the devil's not hiding anymore. The and devil's if there's, there. If there's that type of evil, that means there's that type of good. There's an equal and opposite force. And as you just see, man, like you said earlier, everything's coming true that's in the Bible. It's because it was written by God. Jesus, before Jesus came, there was hundreds of prophecies. Every single one of them was fulfilled. Every single one. So it just shows, man, the word of God was written. What is the most, who is the most famous person in the entire world? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. They know he came. Well, how is the BC and AD, before Christ, after Christ? The entire world goes on that type of metric system for our, our dates. And it was the most significant thing that ever happened on this earth. And, you know, God wants to come here. He wants to save people. He wants to give you salvation. He wants to give you peace right now. And then that takes away the anxiety when you fully submit to the God because you know at the end of the day, you can't die. You've already died to yourself. Now you're living for God, and you're always going to be with him. People who don't live for God, people who don't accept Christ in their heart, they'll be separated from God forever in eternal fire. And that's a real, that's a real scary thought to think about you and your loved ones. And, you know, it's, just, it's a decision you can make, and, and you're saved by grace. Nothing, nothing you can do and works. We're not talking about religion. We're talking about a relationship with the Creator. And what was that theory? What do they call it? The Pythagorean theory, where it's like, uh, where they're saying, like, you're better off living a life believing in Christ, and then, like, if it's not real, then you just lived a good life, than living a life um, not believing in Christ, sinning, and then when it's time to repent, and there is a Christ, it's like, oh, f- it's, it's too like, late. The risk is not worth the reward, you know? Like, it's... Yeah. You're better off. And it's like, yo, you never seen somebody like, 
follow the Bible and be a man of Christ and be like, oh, that fucking guy. You know what I mean? Like, you're like, yo, don't, you know, like, you're not going to talk bad on your neighbors. Just like, it's yeah. just, it just makes sense. And, and, and like we were saying, bro, nowadays with the way things are going and like the things they're pushing, it seems like yeah. anything good, they don't really want to like, you know, well, like, it's all not, against the, God's design. Exactly. That's, yeah. that's what you said. It, it works out for them because family, they're against the families, male and female. They're all against God's design. And you see when there's a broken family, when there's divorce, when there's so much brokenness in this world, and you see someone who walks that path of God, you know, he's at such peace. And that's because he's living the way God designed us. That's heavy, man. Yeah, that, yeah, you're like, you're, it's like you're, I call it, I call it like, um, what do I call it? Like God's will is like, I feel like whenever I'm doing right, I feel like I'm living God's will, you know? Yeah. And then I feel different. Like I know. And like, and it's weird. Like we all have a conscience, but some, I always wonder like, do people not feel bad about things or they do, but they can just shut it more. Like how does well, that work with the blind. con? Or, they're, you, or when, they're just blind. When you Ignorance sin so long, you don't see, like Jesus said, forgive them for they know not what they do. Because those people that do those evil things, they literally don't know what they do. That's why God says forgive them, even though that can be the hardest thing. But there's they, they literally, because if they knew what they were doing, they wouldn't do it because they know how evil it is. And that's why you see some crazy evil stuff. And people that are atheists, people that are lukewarm Christians, you know, that's the people that, you know, they can be demonically possessed and do crazy stuff like shoot up schools and sex trafficking and big shout out to sound of freedom go watch that movie oh, we gotta that's, see that movie dude it's such a that's so evil man and, and then why and then you know what's crazy that movie was not made by hollywood and now hollywood's trying to sh like all trying to shut it down oh yeah it's wild bro like yo if you can't if you think we're crazy and we're like listen we're on this table right now and we're like yo the devil is real there's a movie about traffic the most worst thing that you could ever do and you got people on the news right now calling it a QAnon conspiracy movie. Like yep. they're trying to outlaw us. Like, yo, Christians are the new the new Muslims, bro. We're the new terrorists, dog. Yeah. You know yeah. what I'm saying? I feel yeah. like they're coming after us the same way they did after that. You know, they just pick their back. They just pick their wars, bro. Who they want to go against? Yeah, because it's a threat to them. And I mean, that's the most evil thing you can do. And most, and they ask the pedophiles that love kids and stuff like that, what? How did you end up there? It's they started with pornography. Yo. Yeah. Porn is the bad, bro. Yeah. Ever since OnlyFans, they're, they're rotting society, bro. Porn is like, and it makes it, it's so degenerate and it fucks up everything. It messes up your relationship with women too. Like, yep. it's messed up my relationship before with women, you know, we're like, because you think you watch a porn and you watch, I've been watching, bro, I've been watching porn since I was like young, bro. Yeah. I remember the first time I found porn, like, yo, it was on my, we had the, you ever seen the, um, the cable boxes back in the day? Yeah. Uh, remember the cable box where, like, if you go on UFC, like, you want to watch the pay-per-views and you have that cable box that has all the pay-per-views yeah. all the time? We had one of those. But I knew on the back, it had, like, a porn channel where if you click it, it had, like, a lock on the back, like a child's lock. But if you unlock it, you can find the porn. And I remember I freaking found that, that the, the channel one time and we switched it. And we saw, I remember, like, at a super young age, bro, like, watching porn like yeah. crazy, you know? And, like, yeah, it puts, like, an unrealistic expectation of sex in your head, you know? Yeah. And then now it gives you, and then now the women are getting, and now they have the women is so easily, you know. So it's like it's amazing what you can do when we put a camera in front of somebody. Like what the camera really fucks us up. Yeah. The human species is like really weird when it comes to fame and like um, clout. Like it's, yeah. I don't know. It's like something like they, like the Bible almost knew about it. I seen this thing about the iPhone, like Adam and Eve biting the apple, uh, biting yeah. the apple and the iPhone, the yeah, Apple I saw iPhone. That was said that. You yeah, saw that, yeah. bro? That was hit, bro. That was that clip. I had that clip on repeat, bro. Yeah. On repeat, where he's like, "Smells like communism." I was like, "Bro, he nailed it." You yeah. know, Like they're trying to, just, yo, that's what they're doing in America. Like America used to be strong. Like before the Federal Reserve, like every American, like you can, you can live and have a good house. Like you can just work in your factory job, right? Like before, yeah. like in the 1930s, you can have a wife, a fucking badass wife, hot chick, right? Get like four kids. Yeah. You can have a big ass property. Your wife, you know, you would raise a strong family. Your kids would protect each other. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. The father would work. The mother would raise the kids. And then when the Federal Reserve came into the bank, boom, then like they went off the gold standard. So the money wasn't. Yeah, they created The money a started changing. They made the inflation. Yeah. They created a crisis. And now the mom needs to go to work to pay for the bills too. That they So they inflated everything. So now everybody's got to go to work. Yep. And the parents go to work. Now the government raises your kids. Yep. Go to public school, free education, everything free. Bro, that shit's free. It's not good, dog. That's what yep. we learn in life, right? If it's free and from the government, it's not for me. Yeah, what, is, <laughs> what does that guy say? The, the biggest. The biggest five lies you ever heard in the world were from the government and we're here to help. Yep. 
Like the government don't help nothing, bro. And coming from Cuba, it was kind of weird. Like for me being Cuban, like my dad always raised me like this way. Like I've always been like, always thought like this, you know? So people now they're like, oh, this guy's a conspiracy theorist. Like, nah, I grew up with conspiracy theorists. If you fucking Cuban in Miami, you probably like, yeah. you already had your eyes uh, on yeah, the you, you can sniff out. You can sniff it out. That's what yeah, it is. Yeah, because you've been through it. You smell it. Like, my dad yeah. has always been like... So nowadays, now it's like, yeah, now they try to, like, um, separate you and, like, you know what I mean? Make you feel like you're wrong or something. But yeah. everybody feels the same. They're just scared to talk, dog. Yep. That's what it is. That's why Twitter is the main platform now. Elon yes. Musk making it freedom of speech. Bro, he's going after it. All and the then, crypto on there, too. Is that where, they, is that where the... All the okay, crypto so there. The crypto, this is a good segue, bro. The crypto is a good way to segue into the, um, into, into getting away from the front, getting away from the, from the Federal Reserve, right? It's yep. a good way to free yourself from the chains of government, right? Like, yep. especially, because that's what I'm worried about, too. This is why I really want to get involved in crypto now, because in the future, the more they try to shut things down and the more Amazon takes over and the more small businesses close, it's like, oh, we need to get our money out of here. Because yep. I don't think nobody's money is going to be safe pretty soon. Yeah, absolutely. That's what, you know what I mean? Yep. That's what's scary. You got to diversify it. Gold, silver, crypto, cash. Do you know about gold? Do you property. Know, do you know, yeah, but what about property? Is property no good if they're going to like, um, is property no good because they could just take your property? Like the government could just take it? Like how do you? I mean, yeah, but property is always good to have. And um, it's a good thing to diversify your assets in that. How do you buy gold? Like what about, like gold is like very similar to crypto, right? Like it holds its value? Yeah. Yeah, I mean it's it's slow mover, but it's it's always been and it's always gonna be. But when you get gold, how, when you got like a big gold treasure chest in your house, or you gotta like keep it and like you got somebody who's holding your gold. No, I mean you know put what I'm saying. Like, safe. it's good to have some silver and gold, like actual gold. But then what do we yeah. do with it, bro? Like if everything goes, if there's a, if if World War Three happens and the nuke drops or something, and everybody's just like living Barter walking the dead. Oh yeah. yeah, yeah. I say yeah, I have gold. You got food. Boom. Bro. But that's why silver. They say silver is even better because that will be, you know, a big chunk of gold. It'll be too valuable. You know what I'm saying? Oh yeah. yeah. So silver you can like, but yeah. we gotta learn how to cut it up. Though we gotta get some freaking. Yeah right. <laughs> it's like yo, I got this big ass thing of gold. Yeah, like, yo, no come doubt. back next week, bro. No doubt. No <laughs> you doubt. You there with like a lighter trying to change it. <laughs> yeah. This is why I think that training martial arts is like the best investment I made when I was a kid, dog. Because now with all this shit happening, I feel like people are always going to need to learn jiu-jitsu, dog. Yeah, no So doubt. like in any, in any world situation that happens, I feel like I'm going to have a part, dog. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, you're ready. Against the aliens, too. I'm unvaxxed, dog. <laughs> so if there's like an alien revolution, dog, you know, they're not going to be able to scam me, dog. So I feel yep. like unvaxxed blood is going to be big in the revolution. Yeah, <laughs> no doubt. Yeah. So I'm like, I got that purebred. So I feel like I got a good, I got a good role in the, yeah. in the revolution or whatever is gonna happen, dog. Yeah, but. we'll see, man. Oh that's, yeah, yeah. That's the good thing about knowing your final destination if you're if you're saved, man. Because then whatever's gonna happen is gonna happen. But you know where your final destination. There's a peace in that. And you're feeling at peace, right? Like, um, yeah. What is it about the something you can see with all religious people? Like once. When it's something about like dealing with dealing with um like hardship too like i noticed like my dad's very religious and like it's just people who are religious they have like a better uh, understanding of like heart of heartache you know what i mean so yeah because they're not going through it alone yeah he goes to church and like yeah exactly yeah, yeah. um how often do you go you go to church now like yeah we go we have a church here and we do a bible study and stuff oh yeah. nice uh i saw you do the bible study with some of the fighters and stuff too yeah yeah that's dope man yeah um you were training at Sanford. That's where you met Nate Marquardt, or he brought you over no, from I met, Thailand, I right? I met Nate um, Colorado? a long time ago in Colorado, yeah. We started training together very early. And then you guys, damn, bro, back in the day, but like after Strike Force and stuff, right? Like from Marquardt? Yeah, right after Strike Force, yeah. Is he still in, he in my. Is he in Florida right now? Yeah, he is. Yep. Oh, man, we got to hit him up, bro. Yeah, we got to get him out here. You do. Bro. I've been watching Nate Marquardt, dog, when he knocked out Tyrone Woodley in Strike <laughs> yeah, Force yeah. with that 37 yeah, piece legend. elbow, bro. Are you kidding? He hit him yeah. with the fucking forty-two Sickest piece. Knockout. That was a video game. That was, he was on the his coach was on the controllers when he hit that knockout, yeah. bro. Insane. Yeah, what a good dude. He's yeah, he's not afraid either, bro. He's a he's he's a G he's with it, man. Truth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's, he's speaking got a podcast truth. Now too. I saw that. Yeah, I've been following it and stuff, man. Yeah. And then he's the one that brought you down and like, yo, check out uh, Sanford and stuff yeah. like this. Yeah, he came down first. Yep. Yeah, I got a lot of French. You ever train with Elvin out there? Elvin Espinosa. You know who Elvin is? Uh, uh, I don't. Prodigy. Think so. No. Um, but you were getting work with Henry and all these guys too. Yeah, yep. 
Oh, Hafa, Hafa from my when Thailand closed, he was there with oh, you yeah. guys at the Hoffa same time, Hoffa right? Fazeev, yeah, man, it was awesome to have him there. He's such a good coach too, man. I love his style. Uh, was he coaching in Sanford or just no, when you, no? When you... But I still worked on the side with him. Yeah, yeah. His remember he's coaching in, and he was that's one of my favorite classes. Man, his uh, his timing and style and, just, uh, and combination. His his what do you call it? His off rhythm, his rhythm. Yeah. Like the way he can disrupt rhythm is like, oh my god. Yeah. When you spar with him, it's just like. You're stuck in the woods, dog. Like whenever yeah. you see a fighter in the UFC and people are like talking shit, like, "Why well, is this guy not moving?" It's like it's because there's things happening that you can't understand right now, dog. Yeah, These guys yeah. are fainting and doing things, and you just like every time you move, you get hit. So then you just stay stuck. Yep. And that's how I felt like when I was spar with him, you know. Yep. Yeah, man. Damn, dog. So wrestling base helped you out, kind of wrestling, kind of saved your life. Yeah. If you think about it, you know what I mean. Yeah, it was one of the things that helped for sure. Because, I mean, through jail, I mean, what would jail have been like without having any type of martial arts experience? Yeah, I mean, it would have been rough, man. I'm just glad that I got locked up in Spain where they let me train, you know, because I wouldn't have been able to train in America. Bro, no way, huh? It would yeah. have been totally different. Totally different, yeah. So I'm blessed that I got caught there and not in South America and not in America. Professional now for what? How would you say, like, how long have you been professional now MMA? About... 10 years pro or like 15 um, years professional yeah come like eight years yeah and now you got the decision to make where you're like okay do i want to like to ready to make the play to the next to the next step is it hard making the transition now from like uh from injury to like knowing you want to fight again soon to now thinking all right i'm gonna focus on just completely other things and, and yeah i mean it's definitely tough you know it's like a piece has gone but um no i'm still working my way back into training i'm fishing a lot doing crypto so I'm blessed I have other things to kind of focus on and a, another source of income or else I'll be, you know, well, that's a lot the, of fighters don't have that. Well, that's the thing, man. That's the thing that I noticed more. That's one of the things that I got so grateful with. That I saw you were doing commentating too. Yeah, doing some commentating right? as that's well. Right? That's awesome, yep. bro. Yeah. Uh, were you, that was that LFA? Which one were you commentating? Uh, no, it was, uh, I've commentated with um, XMMA, um, but also this one was like called Ice Wars. It's kind of like a new up and coming. It's like hockey fights. It's like boxing and hockey. It's no way. Legit. Yeah. And uh, how'd you get this? Like, you got a manager or like? Uh, yeah, I have a manager, but uh, no, that was kind of a gig I got on my own. Nice, man. Yeah. How'd you like commentating? It's like fun. Oh, I love you good, it. Yeah. Uh, I've been doing it for a couple years now. So I definitely think it's a good avenue and kind of a way to stay in the game and, um, you know, still be around it. That's good for fighters. You know, that's one of the things too. Yeah. Like, you know, podcasting, you know, breakdown, fighting and breakdown analysis. Yeah. Um, it's hard, man, it, it, for sure, because we're used to like the certain life and training and this grind and like getting it in all the time, and then now it just stops out of nowhere. Yeah, you know, and you're just like, oh, what next? And we need somewhere to put that energy. Yeah, because you know? I'm like exactly. the same way as you, bro. Like I had like, growing up, I've always had a very addictive personality. I always wonder where that came from. I don't know if it's hereditary or if it's like, um, or what it is. Yeah. you know that that feeds that. But um, yeah, I always need to have like, what is that saying? Idle hands is the devil's playground. Yeah. You know, so like just the more things get, uh, the the more stagnant, the, the more bad things I find to do. Mm -hmm. You know, so like I got to stay yeah. busy. Yeah. And for fighters, man, it's hard because you go from training all day long and then it's like you want to replace that feeling, you know, yeah. that feeling of the win and it's yeah. hard. Yeah, it is. I noticed that um, like some, yeah, if you fight a lot, then you go to a lot of after parties and then you realize. <laughs> yeah. And then like, oh, shit, these after parties and camps are getting mixed up in between each other. So yeah, it's, exactly. it's hard to find that even keel, you know? Yep. Yeah, exactly, man. So now you got cryptocurrency going on. Where can people find the crypto channel? It's already growing uh, pretty fast, man. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the Crypto Kings, me and my buddy B Roots, my partner. So check out that. Also follow me on Twitter, Ian Heinish MMA, um, if you want to get some crypto tips and check it out. And uh, also Instagram as well. Yeah, nice. What, so what what are we looking? What do you recommend? Buying Huddle, buy buy Bit <laughs> Bitcoin to store, and then Pulse we get up. And then we get on the and then we get on the little guys for the for the come up for the for the yeah yeah I would say Ethereum you're gonna get more gains you know uh -huh. not financial advice obviously but because um, Bitcoin you might really only get a three x four x realistically you probably could get a six x from Ethereum but Pulse Chain it's Pulse a new, Chain it's a new layer one blockchain out so this is the new out. one coming out yep Pulse Chain my man in. It was a pleasure having you, my brother. Yeah, man. A super inspirational story, man. Thank you, man. Thank you. I'm glad that you found your way. You know what I'm saying? I'm glad that you got something going on right now. And, bro, I don't think it's over, man. I think with with the technology that we have nowadays, you know what I'm saying? I feel like we can both make a comeback soon. Yeah, you know God I mean, willing. Bro? Yes, sir. You get there healthy, and then, like, I bet you, like, after a year or two, you get back in the gym. 
It's hard though, man. Like the the the, the brain one is is the hardest one yeah, to, to deal really with, is. and that's the one that you gotta be. I rather be you careful. play it safe and then play it sorry. Mm-hmm. You know, because once I mean we're at that point where we're still it's still irreversible. Yeah. You know, and we don't want to be vegetables, bro. You know what 100%. I'm saying? And that's one thing I think for fighters coming up, right? With the sparring and stuff like that, yeah. bro. The ginger you had is from the training. So it I, was. I think it was that's... from the training, man. And that's one thing I want to just tell young athletes, man. You know, you're the CEO of your business. Do not be pressured by a coach, a manager, or whatever. Find people around you. You pay them. You're the boss. So find people you trust to be advisors for you. And, um, you know, if you feel like concussions, you get rocked hard. Take time. Your brain can heal. But if you don't let it heal, you're going to end up in a situation like me. So. Yeah, yeah for sure. Yeah, if the, with the concussions, man, you got to think of it like there's a bruise on your brain. Like, that's what Hooker said in the last pod. Like, yo, there's a bruise in your brain. You got to let that bruise heal. You know, if you got a bruise in your leg and you keep on getting kicked in the leg every day, it's never going to get better. Yeah. And um, the young athletes, I don't think they know. And especially when guys first start, they just want to go hard all the time. Yeah. And they don't understand, like, the impact of getting hit all Train the time. Smart, yeah. And, um, yo, the thing is, you have a chin forever. Like, you're fucking unrockable. And then once it happens, you're like, oh, shit. And sometimes you think it can't happen to you. So that's one of the things I always try to like be be wary of too, you know. Yep, like absolutely, um, just you're the future, you know. Yeah. Yep. There's life after fighting. My man, yeah, I know you got a little bit of a trip home. Yeah. It's Sunday. I really appreciate the time, yeah, my brother. Absolutely. That was a great little chat, man. Yeah. I hope the fans got some inspiration from yeah. that, dog. If anybody's going through any hard times in their life, bro, anything going on, you know what I mean? I'm sure they can contact you. Yeah, uh, absolutely. If they're looking to find Christ or get involved in the church, yep. what do you recommend for a guy that doesn't know and wants to like looking at religion and stuff like that? Um, just get a Bible, get a devotional, a Jesus calling one, and just just start reading that and seek truth, man. Find a local church that is non denominational, just straight from the Bible, and um, you know, just plug in, man, and and just keep seeking truth. Ladies and gentlemen, that was a heavy one. This is gonna be a big episode, dog. I'm looking forward to this one. Honey Badger Hour. Episode, I don't even know. We're out.